Presbyterian Universalist Fellowship in Laguna Beach. My name is Pamela Floodman, and I will be serving as your worship associate for today. In a few minutes, we will be lighting the chalice to start the service. So if you have a candle at home, I invite you to retrieve it now so that we can light our chalices together. Here at UUFLB, we are meeting each Sunday morning by remote technology, and we will continue to do so for as long as is necessary. During this time, our Sunday morning gatherings are an important opportunity for us to come together as a community and to welcome the guests who are visiting UUFLB today for the Zoom service or who may review the recorded service at a later date. On this Memorial Day weekend, our service is titled Serving Those Forgotten or Invisible. And we are delighted that John Bloom Ramirez is joining us this morning as our guest minister. So welcome to all. Each Sunday, anywhere there is a service held in a Unitarian Universalist congregation, a chalice is lit. If you have a candle at home, you may wish to light it with us now. Our chalice lighter this morning is Lexi Kraut. Lexi has been coming to UUFLB since last spring. When we were still able to meet in person, Lexi um, says that she was often seen in the windowed room at the back of our sanctuary during the service with her son, Alex. Lexi says she began using this room after she and Alex were caught talking during church services. And although I personally am always happy to hear Alex or others um, uh, use their voice during services, it makes me wonder whether maybe the real reason why Lexi and Alex found that room was that it's a lot of fun to play with the toys back there during the service <laughs> while also listening to, um, to what, what is going on. Um, a few weeks ago, Lexi was thrilled to become a member of UUFLB. So a little later this morning, she will talk more about what that means to her and why she chooses to pledge to the congregation. So now, if you wish, please join us as Lexi lights her chalice, or perhaps she al already has. There we are. As Lexi lights her chalice. Our chalice lighting words this morning are written by Reverend Cynthia Landrum, the minister of the UU Church of East Liberty in Clark Lake, Michigan. For those who serve. In honor of those who have served and those who continue to serve at home and abroad for peace and in war, we light our chalice and we offer our thanks. So thank you very much, Lexi. And I could see Alex is there as well. Thank you for lighting our chalice this morning and for being a member and all that you contribute to the um, congregation. So again, welcome to all who have joined us this morning for worship. Our fellowship is dependent on the love and the generous contributions from our members and the many ways that we work together to maintain community and to make a difference in our world, even during this time when we are only able to gather online. So this morning, I would like to say a special thank you to our board members, Peggy, Tom, David, Donna, Don, and Mike, many I know of whom are with us this morning for worship. The board works tirelessly to support the work of the fellowship, and we are grateful to you all. And I would like to also thank all of the individual members who join in the many tasks that keep everything running smoothly within our community. It really does take us all, so thank you. Our fellowship is served by our minister, Reverend Lee Marie Sanchez, who deserves our deep gratitude for her leadership in supporting our faith community at UUFLB. Reverend Lee Marie leads our service once a month, is together with us on other Sundays to join us in worship, and also joins in many other events, meetings, and discussions, both scheduled and impromptu, I think, throughout the week. I want to make, briefly make a few announcements this morning. First, as you may have noticed on the order of service, today we will be including spoken joys and sorrows in the service. Now that we have mostly <laughs> adjusted to the technological challenges of holding a worship service by Zoom, we believe that we will be able to meaningfully incorporate joys and sorrows into the service. So later on 
you will be invited to raise your hand or send a Zoom chat message to let us know that you would like to share a brief joy or sorrow. I also want to remind you that we are recording the service. And I learned this week that any chat messages that you send are also captured when we, um, when we record the service. And this is both messages that you send to the entire group, to everyone, but also if you send a private chat message to someone else during the service, that message will be captured um, uh, when we finish the recording and can be seen by whoever is doing the technical assistance for the service. Of course, we're not going to be sending out the chat messages to anyone, but it just occurred to me when I learned about this this week that others might not be aware of that Zoom feature. So I decided it to mention, mention it to all of you this morning. So the second announcement is that we will be having our annual meeting on Sunday, June 7th, immediately following the service, and I hope that all will be able to attend. During the meeting, we will be approving the proposed budget, for the next fiscal year and will elect our board of trustees. Our board president, Peggy Mears, has sent out an email message with the information which you can review prior to the meeting. The proposed budget, the slate of nominations for the board of trustees. And I think that Peggy may also still be accepting offers of help with the various tasks that are needed for this meeting to run smoothly. So please do go ahead and reach out to Peggy if you are interested in lending a hand. I'm willing to bet she can find a way that you can help. So now Lexi will speak with us briefly about what UUFLB means to her and why she chooses to pledge. Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. We can. Okay, good. So uh, I choose to pledge because I get a lot out of the services every Sunday and I want to do my part so that it continues. Um, UUFLB welcomed me while I was going through a personal crisis and I want to do my part to make sure that we can welcome the next person that's looking for a spiritual home during whatever they may be going through in their life. So. Um, also, my, my dad has this saying that he's been telling me my whole life where he says, ain't nothing in this world for free, darling, and kind of a cute little wannabe cowboy accent. <laughs> and so uh, I tend to agree with that, that, you know, what we gain from membership and pledging to UFLB uh, far exceeds whatever we could possibly give. So... That's why I choose to pledge and will continue to do so. Thank you so much, Lexi. Um, I, I can echo many of, of what, your, your, what your words um, mean. They mean something to me as well. Through my connection with UUFLB, I really do find I have opportunities to make more of a difference in the world than I ever could alone um, in our community, beyond. It really is true, I think, that we're stronger together. So I pledge so that our leadership and our members can make strategic plans for the future and so that we can collectively make a difference in the world around us. In Unitarian Universalism, we accept you for who and what you are. These words really do hold deep meaning for me each time I hear them, each time I speak them. At UUFLB, we are a welcoming congregation with membership open to all. Whoever you are, whomever you love, whatever it is that has brought you to join us in worship today, it is the right reason to be here. We unconditionally welcome all of you to our community of mutual caring and serious intent to grow as spiritual and moral beings. Unitarian Universalists subscribe to no single religious creed but have gathered a set of seven principles that guide us as we build a religious community together. On this Memorial Day weekend, the title of our service is Serving Those Forgotten or Invisible. As I have been thinking about this service over the past week, I've been thinking a lot about our sixth principle. As a Unitarian Universalist congregation, we affirm and promote 
the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. This morning, we lit our chalice in honor of those who have served and those who continue to serve at home and abroad for peace and in war, and we extended our thanks to all of these individuals. And yet, sadly, I know that it is often true that those who have served can sometimes feel invisible. And those who have lost loved ones can feel that their service has been forgotten or discounted. Our sixth principle that we affirm and promote the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all, I think that tells us that we should not allow ourselves to forget. So today we are delighted to welcome back to UUFLB, John Bloom Ramirez. John is a candidate for Unitarian Universalist Ministry. He grew up in the San Fernando Valley and considers himself a dyed-in-the-wool valley boy. John received his undergraduate degree from Ashford University in organizational management and with a concentration in human services and a master's of divinity from Meadville Lombard Theologic School. And he says that arts are incredibly important to him, both as a person, as a minister, ever since he became hooked on theater arts during middle school and feels that there is a beauty and solemnity in the arts that can be tapped and brought into worship. So today, John returns to UUFLB to provide us a look at war and the toll that it takes on our soldiers' spirits. We will be exploring whether and how the ideas of beloved community extend to veterans past and present. John will also be staying with us for the coffee hour following the service, and he has told me that he would be happy to answer questions or continue discussing this important topic with us. So to start our exploration this morning, please join me in reading together our centering thought. The words are from Reverend Martin Luther King, and they will be on your screens. Please join me in reading. In the end, the end we will remember the words of our enemies, of our enemies the silence of our friends. Of our friends. Of our friends. Hmm. So... Now I invite you to join and enjoy our opening hymn, number 1010, A We Give Thanks, with music provided by our incomparable music director, Carol Cole. If you are inspired, please join in singing together from home. Um, um, we will be muted. Um, however, by joining and sharing music together, I know this is one of the many ways we connect with communities. So we'll hear Carol sing this um, welcoming hymn and join together with Carol from home. Oh, we give thanks.
Thank you, Carol. That was lovely. So now as we gather to get to, together from our homes for worship, let us take a moment to remind ourselves why we come together as community. I invite you to read the words of our unison affirmation together when and if it feels right for you. May we be reminded and here of our, of our highest aspirations, aspirations and inspired to bring our gift of love, of love and service, and service to, the to the altar of, of humanity. humanity. May we know May we once know again, once again that we are not we are not isolated beings, beings but connected, connected mystery and miracle, and miracle to the universe, to this universe, community, to this community to each and to each, each other. other. Now come to a time in our service to briefly share important events that have touched our lives in the past week. We value this fellowship as a sharing community where our joys are amplified and a caring community where our sorrows are lessened. As I said earlier, this is the first Sunday since we've switched to a Zoom format for which we are including spoken joys and sorrows. Please remember this is not a time for announcements but rather a time to briefly share the life events that have touched you this week. If you have a joy or a sorrow that you would like to share this morning, please raise your hand or send a chat message to me and Don will unmute your microphone. Do we have anyone who has a joy or sorrow they would like to share this morning? I can see Donna does and Mike. Don, if you maybe want to do each once at one at a time. I think Donna's still muted. Okay, there we go. Oh, there you wait. go. You're muted, Donna. <laughs> I, I clicked it the wrong way. Um, so I do have a sorrow this morning. I found out this week that my little doggy uh, is gonna have to have surgery on her knees. She's got something called a patella luxation in both of her knees. Basically it's tricky knee. Uh, she has her kneecap this is pops out. And um, so that's the bad news. The good news is it's once she gets to operation that she won't have any more problems the rest of her life in terms of that issue. So um, that's my, my sorrow to share with everyone this morning, thanks. And John, I think Mike also has a sorrow to share, I, or joy or sorrow to share. Mike, go ahead. No, you're still muted too. Hmm. I don't have a, a tab to unmute Mike. Ah, you don't seem to have a microphone there, Mike. <laughs> Mike, you seem not to have a microphone. So we'll um, maybe in follow following the service, we'll make sure to have an opportunity during the coffee hour to hear from you because your microphone doesn't seem to be detected. Oh, you know what, Don? You could try unmuting the phone, 4249. I think that's also Mike, perhaps. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now, Mike. Thank you for, for, for persisting. All right. Um, I have a joy. And this happened in uh, March. I met Patricia in Long Beach and we went on a cruise and she gave me this. Aww. And that, and I looked at that and I recognized the date because that was the day that we met. 
uh, by accident at the Houston airport. And then she said, turn it over. So I turned it over and I looked at that and I said, I don't recognize that date, uh, January 26, 2020. And she said, with a smile, she said, Michael, that's the day I fell in love with you. So I keep that with me at all times. Well, that's lovely. That's lovely. Tina, did you have a, a, a joy or sorrow to share as well? You're still muted. Um, it looks all so like there is there a microphone for you, Tina? There is a microphone for Tina, but um, it says she's unmuted, but it's not coming through. Tina, I'm so sorry. We're not able to hear your um, sorrow. So if you t if you type it in the chat before we finish this segment, I will read it for you. And otherwise, we can share it in the um, coffee hour that follows the service. Well, sharing both about the upcoming events for ourselves for our pets and individuals. Missy, did you have something to share as well? Wonderful. I did, I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Wonderful, hi. So I'm Missy and a lot of you know my older daughter, Kaden, who's 17. Um, I just wanted to share that she has been working on a special program this year where she was able to graduate from high school a full year early. And so she has become one of the class of 2020 that's not really getting a graduation. And she is going to go to college a year early this fall at the University of San Diego, which is a small, beautiful Catholic university in San Diego. So we're just really happy for her that she set this goal and was able to meet it. Really smart girl. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Don, is there anyone else who had raised their hand? Are there other joys and sorrows to share? I didn't see anyone else. Okay. Well, thank you all for sharing what's going on for you and for your loved ones, family, the, the loved pets in our lives. Um, both the, both the joys of making that first connection with someone important and then seeing how they've remembered it and, and memorialize it to us. Um, let us hold all of these joys and concerns from our congregation, both the spoken and the unspoken in our hearts and minds in the coming week, as we always remember the strength we give to one another, sharing our joys, lightening each other's burdens, pondering the welfare of our community. Now, as we move into our offertory, please enjoy a selection of music from our talented music director, Carol Cole. Where have all the flowers gone? <laughs>
Thank you, Carol. It is as much a blessing to be able to give as it is to receive. In this self-governing and self-sustaining community, <clears throat> we recognize that it is a responsibility to do both and to do both well. Although our usher will not be coming forward this morning in person for the offertory, the information on your screen provides two ways in which you can give, either electronically, online on the left, or by sending a check to the fellowship. The information on the screen is also available in the email message, which you received with a link to join the service this morning. And we will also put the information up again at the end of the service. So now please settle yourself comfortably in your chair. You may want to close your eyes, place your feet on the floor, feel connected to the ground beneath you. Let your hands rest quietly, breathe deeply, allow your shoulders to relax as our guest minister, John Bloom Ramirez, leads us in meditation this morning. Please join with me now in the spirit of meditation, prayer, or contemplation. She was there. She was sitting there with a water cup. It was filled with Pepsi. Her hair was tucked under her beanie. Her sweatshirt it was inside out. The pockets flapping around, filling, filled with her treasures, presumably. She asked me for 75 cents. I told her I didn't have any change. She thanked me anyway. I ordered my food and I decided to get something for her too. I brought her a breakfast quesadilla, though I myself was struggling for money. She ate it carefully, savoring each bite and thanking me between. She'd eat a piece, then fold it closed, like she wanted to save it for later. She eventually ate all of it. I waited and talked with her. She was only just lucid. The words and phrases coming out of her mouth probably made sense to her. I gathered that she was a veteran. She spoke of the sand and the bombs and the Humvees. She did it for school, she said. She did it for her babies, to take care of them, she said. I can only guess recent because she was close to my age. She never looked me in the eye except to say thank you. She thanked me once with a salute perhaps thinking that I was her commanding officer. I told her about Monday's food service at La Palma Park. She thanked me again. I was able to grasp that she once had two children. I say once because she alternated be speaking, between speaking between past and present tense. Her children went to Crenshaw High School. Her son won an award from the state, she said. She spoke of him mostly in the past tense. Her daughter had a dimple, and the man who she disappeared with had two. She said she did not trust the man because he liked her daughter's dimple too much. He was slick, she said. Promised her little girl the world. I wondered what happened to the daughter. I asked her if she had any more family. She didn't answer me directly, just rambled off to the other end of the tiny taco house, talking but not making sense perhaps to herself, but not to me. She finished her food, carefully cleaning up her mess, consolidating her trash into the paper envelope that the quesadilla came in. She thanked me again, and proceeded to continue her discussion about her children to whomever would listen. There was no one listening. There was no one there that I could see. She shambled off, walking into the misty morning. She had never told me her name. I'm reminded of my friend's poem about a raptor who captured a rabbit and the rabbit's keening cry. I imagine her crying like that. I imagine her crying like that for her lost babies. I wonder what happened to them. Did it happen away while she was away at war? Did it happen when she came home? When did her mind break? My heart aches for this veteran. My heart breaks for her children. My soul feels heavy with the burden of her confession. I cannot breathe. My face is wet with rain or tears. I don't know. I can't tell. 
The myriad of emotions that filter through my brain are too much. We mourn the loss of our soldiers who died, but who will mourn for her? Not for who she is now, but for who she was. We can do better. We must do better. How will you do better? Amen and blessed be. This month in quarantine, I've been thinking a lot about family. Biological as well as chosen. As part of the human family, we strive toward beloved community. The King Center, founded by Dr. King's widow, Coretta Scott King, defines beloved community as such. It is a global vision in which all people can share in the wealth of the earth. In the beloved community, Poverty, hunger, and homelessness will not be tolerated because international standards of human decency will not allow it. Racism and all forms of discrimination, bigotry, and prejudice will be replaced by an all-inclusive spirit of sisterhood and brotherhood. Is it though? Is that spirit all-inclusive? I wonder. Let me share with you a story. Imagine a large convention center, bustling with people from the same denomination, ready to tackle the work at hand. During a major session of this large meeting, a group of soldiers marches into the convention hall where the meeting was about to take place, and they are greeted with derision, disdain, and despisement. They are booed, called tools of the war machine and baby killers. Some are even spat upon. Overall, these veterans are not made to feel welcome. A lot of them feel left out, scorned, and hated. I know that when I heard this story, I was thinking to myself, gosh, that's, that's awful. I mean, I'm a pacifist, a conscientious, a conscientious objector to all war, but even I would never stoop so low. It shocked me to discover that this happened in the early 1990s during the first Iraqi war. Even more shocking, it happened on the floor of the Unitarian Universalist General Assembly during the service of the living tradition and the military personnel welcome. So then this made me ask the question, does beloved community extend to all those that serve and have served our country? I don't think it does. I'd like to, but realistically, the words by the King Center, they say, in the beloved community, poverty, hunger, and homelessness will not be tolerated because international standards of human decency will not allow it. 1.5 million veterans live in poverty. 40,000 veterans are homeless. Of the 40,000 homeless veterans, almost 25,000 of them are living in temporary facilities. But that leaves more than 15,000 without any reliable shelter. Of that 1.5 million veterans living in poverty, how many are going hungry? How many of those veterans living in the street actually get a meal? And how often? Let's go back for a moment to my opening reflection about the interaction I had with that homeless veteran. This occurred to about two years ago and actually inspired this sermon. I had just dropped my son Jordan off at Fullerton College for his last final, and I was hungry. So I stopped off at Taco Bell to grab some breakfast. I did not know this woman was a veteran until she tried to salute me. It was then I noticed that she was wearing some clothing items that would indicate that she had served. Her description of the sand and the bombs and the Humvees would indicate to me that she had served in the current war. She wasn't that old. She was probably my age, if not younger. She mentioned her children, specifically a son and a daughter. I gathered from the conversation that her son had died and her daughter was missing, 
possibly in an abusive or at the very least questionable relationship. She was only cognizant with me part of the time, with the other part focused on talking to people that only she could see. I sat there shell-shocked after she'd left. I know Memorial Day is supposed to be about the soldiers who have fallen and who have died, who have sacrificed for our country. And we honor veterans who are currently serving and those that are in uniform and who have served. Um, but what about those in between? How do we honor them? The United States has not issued a formal draft since Vietnam. We instead have an entirely volunteer military force. Growing up, it was said that you either had to have stellar grades to get a scholarship, or you had to join the military to pay for school. That's the way I grew up. My husband enlisted right after high school, just after 9-11 had occurred. He had good grades. He was in several advanced placement courses, had stellar SAT scores, but he was not counseled on his options properly. And the only way he could pay for school was to enlist. He served for four, his four years before he separated. He tells me that the majority of the people that he served with, a good proportion of them were from depressed areas in the South. They were mostly white, and there, but there were persons of color that he served with, the vast majority of them being Latinx of culture from California. Racially, there was a hierarchy, and he encountered discrimination with this regularly. Many of the women and men he served with were there for training and the educational opportunities afterwards, and some actually had planned to make a career of it. But mostly, they just wanted to serve their four years and go to school. Just this morning, I once again heard an advertisement on, I think it was YouTube, um, for the US Army promising a significant bonus for those that are enlisting, which as of this morning can total around $50,000. For someone of a working class background, that's a huge enticement. That means financial security and stability, even if it's just for a short while. But what they're not telling you are the costs. My husband has lost 30% of hearing in his one ear and 75% in the other because of faulty earplugs and safety equipment. When he was not while he was not deployed and he served, he still served during wartime and he still has the effects of PTSD because of the mental trauma that he experienced while in the Air Force, serving as a mechanic on jets in Arizona. Neil Scheister write, Schister, excuse me, writes for the UU World that at the National Prayer Breakfast in 2003, then UUA President William Sinkford embodied the dual and for many contradictory strains that characterize the relationship between UUs and, if not the military itself, then the exercise of military power. And in his words, he said, I come here with a great sense of gratitude. Thank you. Thanks for the work that you do, the protection you afford us, the democracy that you help us preserve. But, he continued, he was also one who stood the peace vigil, one whose fervent position was that the United States should only operate with the blessings of the international community, which at that moment they certainly did not have. Sinkford continu continued to celebrate that the United States was a work in progress, built around the dream of a community of equality. For the sake of promoting such a dream, he concluded, many Unitarian Universalists, himself included, were willing to go to war. He qualified his stance with the somber proviso, given the events that were just about to unfold, that were just beginning to unfold. War is not our first choice, and in some sense, it always represents a failure. Most Unitarian Universalists would likely resonate with Sinkford's words, as well as the emotionally charged paradox he finds himself living in, troubled by his government's actions and fearful for his own son, yet supportive of the troops. It is hard for us to reconcile the actions of our military to our own morals or even our seven principles. How do we reconcile our desire to affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person or justice and equality, or equity and compassion in human relations, when the idea of war, war seems 
diametrically opposed to those of the first two principles? How do we hold in beloved community someone who has taken the life of another person in service of their country? Emmerich Taylor, a colleague of mine and fellow Meadville Lombard alum, reminds me that the suicide rate for combat veterans is off the charts, and that is actually the leading cause of death in our military, surpassing the war itself, cancer, heart disease, homicide, and even transportation accidents. He wants to be a chaplain because he wants to be sure to keep soldiers whole and remind them that they have first names and that they have a soul behind the machine. Gun. The Reverend Julie Taylor, Senior Director of Contextual Ministry at Meadville, is also an Air Force Reserve Chaplain. Their reasoning for joining the service was because they saw the need at the time of their posting, there were only two active duty UU Air Force chaplains, one reservist. They echo Emirates numbers and they ask, who serves those that don't believe in a God? Who serves those having a crisis of faith, a need to connect with something greater, but not necessarily the traditional ideas of a mainstream religion? Who's serving the nuns, the undecideds, the agnostics, or the others? Moreover, what about the service of people who are of the LGBTQ community, who are more than often not more often than not, rejected by the fundamentalists. Who serves them? This begs the question, what do we do as a community with this information? And what about the answer to the question, can we welcome back into beloved communities someone who we know has killed another human being in the line of duty? I would challenge that we should sit and embrace that tension because we're still in a war with no end in sight. We need to open our doors in our community to those possibly tortured souls who are likely desperate for normalcy. We need to embrace those who have lost loved ones in conflict. By being a welcoming congregation and denomination, we can be a beacon of non-judgment and solidarity at a time when soldiers are at their most fragile and most vulnerable and soldiers, wives, husbands, loved ones, children are the same. Many UU congregations have extolled the virtues of their congregations welcoming of veterans and active duty service persons. The fact that this shift has occurred and so many are willing to do so speaks volumes. I'm curious and I leave you with this question. Can you think of more that can be done? I also think back to the woman that I had breakfast with on that Thursday. Did she have crisis intervention when she needed it? Could there have been a way to prevent her from being on the street, perhaps through both spiritual and emotional counseling and direction? If she had, could there have been something done to protect her mind from breaking so drastically? If she was reunited with her family, would she have the drive to seek the help that she needed? or are we simply doomed to mourn her as a lost soul this Memorial Day? Beloved community is a global vision in which all people can share in the wealth of the earth because we as UUs respect, have respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are all a part. In beloved community, poverty, hunger, and homelessness would not be tolerated because our Unitarian Universalist principles of the inherent worth and dignity, dignity of every person. Racism in all forms of discrimination, bigotry and prejudice would re be replaced by an all-inclusive spirit of sisterhood and brotherhood, leading us to justice, equity and compassion in human relations with the goal of world community with li peace, liberty and justice for all. Reminding us that Reverend Singford said, war is not our first choice, and in some sense, it always represents a failure. Let us not fail our veterans or their families. Let us welcome back, them back into our beloved community so that we have fewer to mourn this holiday weekend, be they dead or simply lost and forgotten to the world at large. 
maybe so. Thank you, John. Thank you for giving us a lot to think about this morning, for joining us and sharing your experiences. Carol, I can't hear you. I'm sorry, Pamela, heart. I can't hear you. Am I? Don, can I be unmuted? Am I unmuted now? I can we can hear you. Okay, wonderful. So th again, thank you for joining us and, and giving us a lot to think about, sharing your experiences, your thoughts, and your words. And thank you for joining us after the service as well to continue discussion. Now is the time for us to extinguish the chalice within our homes, and this will be followed by a benediction from John Bloom Ramirez. So I'm gonna ask Dara to extinguish my chalice. We extinguish the flame, but we keep it. We keep the light in our hearts with its message of community, of love, of justice for all. We take the flame out into the world in which we live. Even in this time of keeping physical distance from one another, especially on this Memorial Day weekend. We take the flame with us out into the world in which we live until we are together again. Now we'll have a benediction from John Bloom Ramirez. Can everybody hear me? Yes. We hear you. Can everybody hear me now? Yes. Beautiful, now I can hear you, beautiful. <coughs> Sorry about that. Since I lost the last part of that, can we, somebody tell me where we're at in the service? <laughs> we're now going to have the benediction and then that will be followed by our closing song, Let There Be Peace on Earth. Thank you so much, I apologize for that. Technical difficulties as you well know. Our benediction today comes from the, uh, the Reverend Darcy Roeck. There is too much hardship in this world to not find joy every day. There is too much injustice in this world to not right the balance every day. There is too much pain in this world to not heal every day. Each of us ministers to a weary world let us go forth now and do that which calls us to make this world more loving, more compassionate, and more filled with the grace of divine presence every day. And with that, I say, Amen, Shalom, Salam, Namaste, and blessed be. Please join us for your closing song.